healing from the other side. Welcome to Messages of Hope with Suzanne Giesman. Listen, they're all around you, close as a thought or a memory. Messages of Hope. Messages of Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode. I'm kind of nervous. I have as my guest today, one of the biggest podcasters I've ever interacted with, and he's watching my intro. What's he going to think? Do I care? <laughs> Our topic is going to be about all things spiritual. Why? Because Alex Ferrari is the host of Next Level Soul, and we're going to be talking about where that name came from, what kind of things he's learned, and a little bit about his background that brought him to this work. Without any further ado, would you please welcome to the show, Alex Ferrari. Thank you so much. If anyone, I'm nervous, Suzanne. I'm nervous to be with you, my dear, but I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Now, you've already interviewed me four times. Three of them have aired. One's going to air a little later, yeah. uh, but we never did your shows live, so I can see why you might feel a little pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, gosh. So I want to know, first off, how many people say this exact line, what a great last name. <laughs> oh, it's I've had that for a while now. Um, it, that's the nice one. The other one was like, hey, Porsche. Hey, Lamborghini. And I'm like, OK, yeah, everyone need to calm down. Get some get some creative material for God's yeah. sake. Okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, the name is the name has always been a help. Uh, it's good for branding. It's very good for branding. It, you remember it. You remember it in the years. Easy to remember. My husband, every time I say the word, he brings up his Ferrari story, which we won't go into because I want to talk about your story. I read a book that you wrote. We'll go into that. You've actually written two, but they're not about spiritual topics. Mm -hmm. You are a film producer, post-production person, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've done commercials and such. Uh, tell me about your past work and how you got into being one of the leading spiritual podcasts in the world. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, I started off in the film industry uh, as a an editor first, and then uh, graduated into being a director, directing commercials, music videos, features, television, um, also anything I could basically do. Opened up a post-production house, which for people who don't know what that is, is basically an editing house with, you can color grade there, you could do visual effects there. And I did that for about 25 years or so. And uh, I've done, uh, we'll get into the story of my book, which kind of, you kind of get an idea of where that, where I started there. But um, from there, I, in 2015, after I had, I had kind of got sick, it, about 2012, 2011, yeah, about 2012, I got uh, kind of disillusioned with the business, the film industry. So I wanted to start something new, and I had the bright idea of opening up an olive oil and vinegar gourmet shop in Los Angeles. Oh. And we had the largest shop in L.A. that we had 50 or 60 big giant fushtis of olive oils from around the world and vinegars from around the world. I love those stores. Yeah, I didn't know yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, not many people do. Um, there might be a book coming out about it, but we will talk about that later. Um, but I did that, and it was probably one of the toughest – three years of my life. It was absolutely brutal, uh, physically, mentally, spiritually. Uh, the pressure put on my family, pressure put on my, on my relationship with my wife, who I've been with for 18 years now. It was a brutal time. So during the end, towards the end of that, I started reading a book called The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. And that kind of introduced me or reintroduced me back to the online business world. I actually had an online business in 97. So in the early, early days of, of the internet, I was already making money on the internet and figuring things out. And with my first big film that I did, I sold it online, I was doing things that nobody had done before. Um, and kind of, so I understood the online world fairly well, but I had kind of lost my um, confidence, if you will. So I, I never forgot. I'll, uh, I did this as a test. I opened up my old Amazon affiliate account. An affiliate is like you, you if you sell a product from Amazon, they give you a little bit of money. Uh, and I was like, you know what? Let me post something on my Facebook page. And I posted a book that I was reading. And I go, hey, guys, I'm reading this book. If you want it, check it out. And the next day, someone bought the book. One of my 
people who followed me or a family member or something. And I made 11 cents. And I like, <laughs> it's possible. It's, it it kind of gave me the, the courage to go deeper. So for about a year, I'd learned, I must have read 30 books about online business, everything like that. And I decided to open up a, a podcast in the filmmaking space because that's where I knew I had my base in the filmmaking space. So I launched it and I thought it was late. 2015, everyone's got a podcast in 2015. What am I doing? I launch it. Within three months, I'm number one in the filmmaking space. Hmm. Um, because I, I I don't know if you know this or not, Suzanne, I I tend to, to do a lot of content. I, I, I hustle a lot. I create a lot of a volume. Well, we so, were talking to everybody before the show started, and he does 30 podcasts a month. Figure that one out. Like, right? some I like, two, two. <laughs> <laughs> so I do, we do a lot between all the shows I do. We do a lot. Could, could we jump ahead? Because I really want to dive into your spirituality and what you've learned from this. How did you choose? How did you end up in the spiritual path? So I'm, I was going to get to that. So after I launched my, my first podcast, um, I started interviewing some of the biggest movie stars and Oscar winners and all that kind of stuff. And I grew a business that I had left. I shut down my post-production house, all of that. And then um, I've had a spiritual guide um, probably for about 25 years or so. In physical form almost. or not? Physical. I always say physical. She's here. She's okay. here. She was a guest on my show. Her name on is On this show, you have to ask that question. Yes, on my show as well, by the way. I always have to, to say that. So at one point she told me, she's like, Alex, I think you need to open up a spiritual podcast. And I go, you, what? Are you insane? I'm a film. I have no street credibility I have no credit. I have no, like, why would anyone listen to me about spirituality? I'm, I don't know anything really. I've read some books. I've, you know, it's been kind of a closeted spiritualist, if you will, uh, most of my life, but it was not something I was really into. She's like, no, that's, well, you got to kind of open it up uh, and you got to open it up in three weeks. I go, I'm sorry, three weeks. She's like, I go, kind of, that's impossible. You can't open up a, a podcast, a website, uh, get guests, logos, a name. In three weeks, she's like, it is impossible, but not for you. I'm like, all right. Mm -hmm. So I, in three weeks later, on Easter of 2021, I launched Next Level Soul. Now, whether the name came from is very interesting. Of course, that was my, uh, you see me look down, I was going to write it on my little clipboard here. That's the next <laughs> question. Next Level Soul. So Next Level Soul is interesting because I was like, I was very skeptical of the whole thing, honestly. When I started it, well, um, what thing of doing a podcast or the whole spiritual field? Well, the whole no, no, the spiritual field. I'm not skeptical at all about. It was this podcast and me in it, like okay. my my part in this this little play that we're all in, like as a spiritual. Yeah, let me give a spoiler here because the book I read about him is he shot a movie that well he was hired to be a director for a movie about a gangster, which never came about, a mobster. So this mm -hmm. is a big shift yeah it's a completely i mean i'm i'm talking to literally oscar winners and big movie stars and things like that and i'm like gonna jump over to channelers and near-death experiencers and things like that so it just didn't it didn't really click for me it was really a difficult lift but i trusted my spiritual guide and i said okay we'll launch it so how the name came about was i was looking and trying to figure out names and see what wasn't taken in the spiritual space is very dense you know, everybody's, you know, there's a lot of companies, a lot of websites, things like that. And I was like, all right, God, if you want me to have this show, you got to give me something here that is, I can trademark that I have, I can have all the websites are available. Uh, no one is doing anything with it. Uh, and that is, is, is going to be mine. I love so I that you asked that. Oh yeah, I did. I, I, this is, this was my whole thing with next level. So when I was starting it, I was like, look, guys, if you want me to do this, I need some help here, man. Cause I can't, I can't, I can't wrap my head around this. I'm doing the work, but I need help. So right. I went into a meditation and in meditation, I asked the question again in meditation and three words just popped into my head. Next level soul. I was like, Oh, that's nice. That has a nice ring to it. All right. Let me look. And then I got out of meditation. I was like, all right, let me, let's look it up. And I started searching. I'm like, okay. It's free. I guess it's next level soul it is. So I'm like, that's kind of nice. It's, you know, it kind of goes along with my brand a little bit and what I do and how I approach things. So I was like, this makes sense. You mean like so taking I, it to the next level, right? Yeah. Like, how, yeah, because my first shows are called like indie film hustle, bulletproof screenwriting. Like, it, they're a little bit, there's a little male energy to it. 
So it's, it, you know, and in the spiritual space, there's not a lot of male energy, which is fine, but I wanted to bring, I wanted to bring a balance because as a, as a, as a man, I wanted to bring next levels, like a, it's yeah. a little testosterone action. And but then in so fact, <laughs> your first, your first slew of shows were mostly men. You had this collage at the top that, that had all the people you'd interviewed. And I looked and I remember saying to Lynette, I said, they're all men. <laughs> What is this? Because I, I didn't know it. Like I was just trying to figure it out and men were the ones that were coming in. And I know it's great. Mostly. That's that balance that really is kind of lacking in this field. Right. I, I, th I think that's one of the unique things I bring to this, to this arena is that I'm, I'm a guy and I am a, I'm a guy's guy. Um, but I been raised by females and have females around me all the time. My whole family is all female. That you know, like and, <laughs> right. So I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of feminine energy throughout my life. So, you know, I didn't have a lot of male energy, generally speaking, but I was still a dude. And when I hang out with guys, I still have, you know, act like guy, and not as guy ish, but still, you know, I watch a good football game and so on and so forth. Um, but I mean, I have a baseball cap on for God's sakes. So, um, so when I started the show, I, I started doing this, the show and, um, a friend of mine called me up and said, Hey, do you want to have the lead singer of Iron Maiden on your show, your new show on spirituality? I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Yes. Uh, I'm like, that makes absolutely no sense. He's like, yeah, but he, he, I'm like, can I ask him spiritual questions? He's like, sure. And you know, his name is Bruce Dickinson. Who's the lead singer of Iron Maiden. Who's not associated with spirituality whatsoever. It's a hard, heavy metal band, but yet we had a very deep conversation about what it's like to be, a rock star, where he gets his inspiration from, his spirituality, where he comes from. And his fans lost it, like lost it, because no one's ever had that conversation with him. Don't and you that feel that if, if we did these with, with people who'd never talk about their spirituality, we would yeah. find that more and more often? Absolutely. That's what I do all the time. I really try to dig in. And I think that's where the evolution of the show will get to, where, where I, I'm able, it will become a safe space for people to come on to who might be big celebrities or who want to talk about, you know, either mental health or spirituality or things that they just wouldn't speak about in a, in a press junket, basically, you know, supporting a movie or something along those lines. So I think that's where we are going. And I have had a handful of those uh, guests already on the show. Uh, so that show kind of took off. I had a good friend of mine, Daryl Anka, who is a channel of Bashar. Yeah. Um, and that's a whole other story of how I know Daryl. He's a filmmaker and I didn't know he channeled for like six years of our relationship. And I, like I said, just started a spiritual show. He's one of the few spiritual people I knew. I was like, hey, do you want to come on and talk about spirituality? His show came on and kind of took off. But the, the channel hadn't really, you know, it took, a, it wasn't really taking off, taking off yet. And then I got scared. So around the fourth quarter of 2020 or 2021, excuse me, I stopped. Hmm. I stopped doing it. I said, oh, no, yeah, I, got, I got to rebuild two websites on my other show. And I created work for myself. And I just was scared. I was terrified because I didn't want to lose what I'd built. You know, I didn't want to be labeled in Hollywood as that spiritual guy or he's gone off the rackers and he's crazy. You know what it's like uh, <laughs> as far as that stuff is concerned. So I got scared. And then my spiritual guide, she said to me, she's like, okay, Alex, listen, you don't want to do this. That's fine. But if you don't do this, universe is going to find someone else to do it because this needs to be done. You're number one on that list. If you don't do it, it will be done by somebody else and they'll just go to the next person. <laughs> I was like, whoa. She's like, so basically crap or get off the pot. I was like, Okay, so uh, that was a very pivotal moment in my life because that was the moment that I sat down in this. I think I sat down in my office somewhere. I'm not sure if it was this was even built yet because I hadn't had a set yet. Like I, I was still doing it on my old filmmaking set. That's I wasn't really taking it seriously yet. Um, and I said, okay, God, if you want me to do this, I need, I need help. And I'm going to have faith that you're going to take care of me and my family. And I'm, that the thing that I've been working on for the last six years is not going to just crash and burn. And I'm going to be desolate. And I'm going to have to go and go back to post-production or go back to editing or go back to doing things I don't want to do um, to support my family. So I will take the leap of faith. But I need you to help me. And I did. And I start, And then I built this little set. I 
set up a system. I started taking it seriously. And then I started reaching out to a lot of people. And at first, you know, because the show was so small, I think in January of 2022, we had around seven, 800 subscribers. We hadn't even been monetized yet on YouTube, meaning that you didn't get over a thousand. You need to get over a thousand subscribers. So I hadn't even been able to get, because I wasn't leveraging my other audience, by the way, that was a very specific choice. So my other audience didn't know anything about this, this side hustle that I had. And I just started the same way that I did it with my other shows. I just started pounding it. I said, okay, one a week is great, but let me start doing two a week. So I started doing two interviews a week and releasing two interviews a week. And then after like about two or three months, I said, you know, three a week sounds a little bit better. Let's start doing three a week. And I just, cause I'm like, the more episodes I get done, the more I'm able to put out, the faster the show is going to grow, the faster everything is going to go. And how many so subscribers started, do you have now? We're closing in on half a million. Yeah. See, yeah, this is what I love. And I know that this is not my normal show that I do because we usually talk about, we will talk about the afterlife and spirituality and all of that, sure. but, but usually with people who've had extraordinary spiritual experiences, but you are a messenger of hope, basically, you know, Appreciate you are getting, you, you are getting the word out there in a big way. Half a million subscribers. It, it gives me hope. It shows me that people are interested in this material and yeah. well, we that's should the, be. Yeah. And that's the and that's the thing that I started seeing as well is like there is a there is a hunger for these conversations, um, but there hasn't been. There are other shows. Don't get me wrong. There are other really good shows that do this work as well, but they don't have the same traction and not nearly as fast. I mean, uh, this is extreme. I mean, I I know the online space. This is a very explosive time. I mean, I went from in October of last year. We were, uh, I don't know how many, a few thousand subscribers. I don't forget how many, 10,000, maybe 12,000 subscribers, something like that. Yeah. A and then we went from 75,000 views a month to 1.2 million in two weeks. That's fantastic. And then so, it just kept going. It kept going. So kept is going. it just quantity or is it the quality? What, what, it's both. You have, yeah, you have a vibe that's really great in your talks. I appreciate that. No, I appreciate it. No, it, I think it's both. It's it's quality because look, you can, I'm a I'm perfect example of it in my filmmaking space. I kept, I pounded, I grinded. I People put out thousands of episodes. It doesn't matter if it's not good. People aren't connecting with the audience. The audience is not connecting with you or they're not finding value with it or not connecting with the, your guests because you've been on other people's shows. You've been on a lot of podcasts, but yet when you and I get together, you know, generally speaking, we, you know, we break about a quarter million ep every episode. Generally, that's a lot for a spiritual. I'm very grateful. Yeah, no, and, and I'm very grateful for you as well yeah. because our conversations are so beautiful. But I say that to impress upon people that there is something happening when you and I get together. Or I have other guests that have the same thing, that they go on other shows and they just, they might even say the same thing, but there's something a little bit different on the way maybe I ask the questions. It's my flavor. It's my, it's my spice. And everyone's got their own spice. I can't compete with anybody else and nobody can compete with me because some people might be turned off by my way. And believe me, many are. I hear it on the comments. Many people <laughs> are turned off by my, by my approach to spirituality and other and they might go somewhere else and that's fine as long as you're getting the message from somebody well, you're you are always very respectful when when we talk together you're, you're funny maybe people don't think that spirituality and humor go hand in hand that that's one of my that's the, i laugh too much apparently oh. i laugh too much um that's called I'll raising say, the vibe folks I was, i'll say i'll say i'll say you know god's sakes or jesus and they get really upset that i like you're using i'm like okay if, if you think that's a problem it's probably not the show for you because it's you know I, i'm not doing doing it in a disrespectful way it's just it's just language and if anyone actually listens to my shows they know how much i respect those ascended masters so you know, those kind of things, but I'm not everyone's flavor and that's okay. You can't be anyone's flavor because the moment you try to be everyone's flavor, you're no one's flavor. And that's the way I approach everything. So I am 100% authentically me. I don't try to skew myself to, to an audience or to a guest or I'm who I am, whether you like it or not. And I'm just lucky that people seem to resonate with the way I'm approaching this subject matter. Well, I am just itching to dive in and recreate that vibe that happens when we talk spirituality. Sure. With that backstory, I want to know 
how you have changed spiritually from what you've learned talking to so many people? I have a very unique perspective because I've spoken to, now we're at episode, I think we're in the 330s or 340s of, as of this recording, but I've recorded probably another 30 or 40 episodes I haven't really released yet. So I'm like maybe 360, 370 uh, conversations, deep conversations about spirituality from every walk of life, from channels to near-death experiences, to, to yogis, to gurus, to swamis, to quantum physicists, um, uh, you know, geologists, neuro neuroscientists, everybody about this subject matter. And you cannot help but pick up a couple things along the way. That's the thing. When you were at, you've asked, no, you know the answer to this question, Alex. <laughs> you're like, well, yeah, but I have to ask it. Yeah, I, I do that too because, you know, I've, I've heard the answer or I know the answer myself, but I'll ask the question because I am very conscious of the audience yeah. and I want to make sure that, you know, and, and sometimes when the guests will, will say something to me, that's a little bit more convoluted or a little bit more complicated. I'll go, so what you mean is really that Mario is really just trying to save the princess and that's your incarnation. And, <laughs> and they go, yes, Alex, that's not the example, but you know what I mean? <laughs> I try to break it down in a way that people understand it and also bring, probably bring some humor into it as well. But I've learned, I mean, to answer your question directly, it's it, it, the growth that I have experienced by watching and watching being part of the show is exponentially changed my life without without question spiritually i i don't have faith anymore i have knowings oh that's good yeah, yeah I, 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 there's my I, first grief bump moment everybody yeah I, a while. <laughs> um it, it, because faith is is wonderful and i think everyone should have faith but i, I there's been such a clear understanding of where I'm going in my life now in the mission that I've been put on earth to, to do. And when you find that mission and that find that purpose, everything, all the, all the BS, all the garbage kind of just starts to, to go away. And you start to see clear, the fog starts to lift if you will. you start to see clearly. So now my, my focus is so pinpoint that not much is going to sway it. Um, my family has seen the difference in me. I was going to um, ask that. Yeah. What what difference yeah. do they see? Well, I've been meditating for years now, probably getting close to six, six, six and a half years or so like that. I've been meditating hour, two hours a day. Uh, so they've seen the change from, you know, daddy who has no patience whatsoever. I knew it was going to be patience. Yeah. Oh, no, it's patience. Absolutely patience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to where I am now. And by the way, I'm still no saint, but I, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you get to a point where you, the, the smaller stuff doesn't bother you as much. Why not? And you still, why doesn't it bother me? Yeah. Because it just doesn't, it, it's almost irrelevant. It's, it is what it is. So if it is what it is then why get upset by something like it? It's like the, if the milk fell off the table and, and spilled onto the floor, yelling and screaming at the milk is really not going to do a whole lot. It is what it is. So you just deal with the situation that's in front of you and you look at it as a curiosity. If it's something as simple as milk, I'm like, why did that happen? Is there something to learn here? Things like that. I speak, I'm speaking like a, a, a yogi, but I don't do it all the time. It, it's just, I'm like, I sit there and go, so what should I learn out of this? No, it's not always that. But generally speaking, my, my perspective on life has changed. It's almost like seeing beyond the code in the matrix a bit. I'm not Neo by any stretch of the imagination, but you start to understand things at a much different level. When you're talking like on the show, when you've spoken to so many different quantum physicists and yogis and gurus about Maya or the illusion or the simulation, you start to look at things or manifestation and how you create your own universe, you create your own life with your thoughts and your brain. You start to test things and you start to see how things work. And you're like, Oh, oh, that one worked. Okay. And and the, the reason why I have a knowing now is my show should not be doing well. Is it the, in the, in the, on paper, it's a horrible, it's a horrible pitch, Suzanne. It's a horrible <laughs> pitch. It really, on paper, it doesn't make any sense. A guy from the film industry with no spiritual background interviews people from the spiritual space and the show does well. On paper, it doesn't make a lot. It doesn't make a lot. Like you make a lot of sense. You know, you, 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 you as a channel 
on paper doesn't make sense. So you and I have that similar vibe because we our backgrounds are so different yeah. than where we are now. But it does work. And there's something about what I do and what you do that resonates with people. I feel so, like that, that word you use, mission, right? When it's come, it comes from another level, that next level, you know. <laughs> you owe me 10 cents. Go ahead. <laughs> owe you 10 cents? Yeah, for every time you say next level, it's 10 cents. I own copyright on that, sir. I didn't know that. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'll pay up. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> so uh, have there been, no, no, that's a yes, no question. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. Tell me about moments when somebody said something that you just couldn't take on board, but perhaps now you see it differently. You know, when I interview people on the show, and I, I call them more conversations than interviews, I, I live in the what if. So I don't walk into any interview with judgment, none whatsoever. I just always am open in hearing the, 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 the way they approach things. So if when I, I interview just interject that everybody is the way to approach life and spirituality in general. It's the people that just say, no, that's BS. And I, and this is ridiculous and change the channel that are missing out. So well, like, thank you. I appreciate that. When, when I interviewed you for the first time, you know, the first part of the first part of that first episode was just me understanding your struggle and your like, how does someone like you turn into a channel? And that was fascinating and, to me. And for anybody who's new to this, I know he's talking about the fact that I served 20 years as a Navy officer and was aide to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, big left brain right. person, and now doing mediumship and teaching spirituality. So, yeah. Exactly. So that that disconnect, I was like, how does that that human being turn into this human being? So that was truly a fascinating conversation. I was really looking forward to our conversation because I'm like, how does that happen? And you were early on. You were one of my earlier, I think within the first 50 or 60 interviews or so that you you uh you came on the show yeah i but, remember lynette saying this guy wants you on his show and i've looked and he doesn't have that many people but and we we say yes to most requests just because we just love to share exactly so, so I, I i kind of what i try to do with my show is i try to hold a safe space for people to come and tell their truths now do i believe all the truths is irrelevant to me so like a perfect example because my wife by the way not a believer. No. no, no, she is a grounded, very practical. Oh, I'm person. grounded. A lot well, of you know what I mean. You know what I mean. But <laughs> then, as she's as we've gone through this show, like I use you as an example. I use Paul Salig as an example. I use Daryl Anka as an example because she knows Daryl. She's she. We've had dinners together. We you know she. They were at our our kids. Uh, uh what is it? The when the baby shower. Like, I mean, wow. we, we, we were there. So they knew them at a, she knew them at a completely, him and his wife at a completely different level. And he's, he's like, he, he channels. I go, this is the way I, anytime anyone asks me about, do you believe this channeling thing? It's like, I mean, it sounds a little out there. I'm like, and if you remember, I go, it sounds nuts. I always say it to everybody, every channel. This sounds crazy. Yeah. But the way I always approach it is like, I don't care if they're channeling this person or that entity or this alien or whatever. What is the end result? That's it. What are they saying? Is don't it? look at, don't look how it gets. Ignore that part. Honestly, is this profound information that will help and change your life? There you go. So that's how I approach all my conversations. Ooh, it's like, I don't, I don't really care about the spectacle. I care about the end result. So if you have a near death experience, you know, there's some near death experiences I've had on my show that I was like, Maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, but did this conversation help somebody mm -hmm. to grieve, help somebody to move on, help somebody to have some comfort in their life after their loved one left? That's how I approach it. Because if you approach it with like, I'm going to, you're not real, you're doing an act, or you that energy, even if you're not saying it, that energy comes out. So my energy is always very open and very safe. So people that come on the show, and, and very rarely it happens. Now more people know what I do. But at the beginning, they were a little, they had their walls up because they've been attacked so much in their life. But when they realize that I have no agenda other than to allow them to tell their truths, 
then it, they open up in ways that they don't open up on other shows. And I think that's one of the other key magical elements that I have or I bring to the show and to our conversations that I truly am here to highlight and spotlight what the guest is trying to bring out and tell their story, give their knowledge, give their experience and so on. But uh, I think if we all kind of live a little bit more in the what if and stop being critical about it, because look, like I said, the Suzanne channel, uh, maybe, possibly, it's irrelevant to me. It really is. I do believe you channel personally, but it's irrelevant because the, the information you put out into the world is helping hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people around the world. So I don't care what the story is and how that information is getting here. I, I, I do believe that you do, by the way. I want to make that very well, clear. You know, even I had a big problem with the channeling thing. And I, I every time right. between channeling sessions that are public, I, I feel uncomfortable. And then I do it and I see the effect it has on people. And first of all, I couldn't do it if it wasn't real. I just, it's not in me. But to right. see the effect and to, to see the healing, it's we're doing the same things for the same reason. Yeah. And, and, and I've said this to so many channels on the show. There are easier hustles in the world <laughs> than to be a channel or a psychic oh, yeah. medium. I oh, mean, yeah. there's so oh. many things you could do easier. If you're trying to like hustle people out of money or scam people, there's millions of things you could do that are le less public, easier than trying to say, hey, I'm a channel now. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying to break this, this kind of mentality down in skeptics. I'm like, what do you? This is tough. That's why I try to humanize my guests who are channels and who are psychic mediums. When they come in, I humanize them in a way of like, how was it with your family? How was it with your friends and your colleagues? How was it with your life? How did you deal? When you heard voices for the first time, did you think you were nuts? Because a normal human being would say, I feel nuts. So I, I try to bring it down to a place where even the most skeptical person can, can just maybe what if, if you live in the what if, life becomes a lot more fun and yeah. a lot more stuff comes to you Ooh, in definitely. a good way. Yeah, and it comes to you. That's perfect. Yeah. So your wife, but she's not there yet, huh? She's getting there. <laughs> That's okay, right? No, no, but it, it, she's, get, she's getting there. And, and it, it's because at a certain point she sees what's happening. I mean, you can't ignore this. Yeah, you know we're we're affecting tens of millions of people a month at this point, um, and there are and it's helping a lot of people. So uh, my wife's very respectful. She's going to be on my show soon. Oh, good, good, good. That She's going to be on my show soon. It's going to be a fun, a fun thing. We got some stuff that we're working on together for for next level soul, but um, it, it's an interesting. It's interesting. Because she's met certain people and she's seen certain people and you you look like someone like yourself or a Paul Selig or a, or a Daryl and you just go, man, this, there's something there. I don't know what's going on, but there's something happening there. Yeah. You know, what is it? So what if? Maybe. <laughs> so let's shift gears here a minute. Yes. You talk about having this human spiritual guide. Jesus, you know, yes. That's, really, that's lovely. Yes. And, uh, in fact, my one of my assistants, Valerie, has just uh, branched out to do spiritual guidance to, to people. I love that. But my question is, have you, do you interact with a non-physical spiritual guide since this journey started? Not a specific person. Um, in my meditations, I get a lot of uh, visions or I'll get ideas or things like that in med in meditation, sometimes yeah. outside meditation, there's not a specific um, master or channel or ascended master or something like that, that I speak to or anything like that. Um, but there is guidance <laughs> happening without question. That's, um, a, that's a really important point because I don't see my guides, but I'm just very aware that the guidance is coming. And when we ask questions, we get it. So that's what I was trying to get to. Do you feel that you are being guided or getting guidance? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There's just, they, look, I got to tell you something, Suzanne. For someone from like myself, who's an A, a tip, like a, a type A personality, very, you know, hustle and I have to, I, I have to control things. I got to hack things in. I got to build it and I have to do it myself and everything. To now to the place where I've completely let go of all of that and I don't have to hustle or, 
or control because I realize that I don't have really that kind of control. This show has shown me that because when those episodes took off in October of last year, I had nothing to do with that. Like I was doing my show. I was showing up, doing the work, cutting the wood, carrying the water. Like that's, <laughs> that was, that was what I was doing. So in September's episodes don't really change a whole lot from October's episodes. Do you see what I mean? Like the guests are different, but I was doing my work. And then all of a sudden things started to take off. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not doing this. <laughs> I, ha I am not talking to the algorithm of YouTube in a way that is hacking. No. And then November and December and every month we went from 1 million to 3 million to 5 million to 7 million to 10 million. And I'm like, I am not doing this. <laughs> I'm doing my work, yeah. but I am not controlling this aspect of, of, of what I'm doing. So that sent me a very clear understanding that I'm like, oh, if I get out of the way, if I get out of the way, things will start to open, doors will start to open up. Everybody listening? <laughs> just get out of the of your own way and stop trying to control things in that sense. Things just start to open up. Like I was, listen, I've been trying to get into meetings with big Hollywood producers all my career. Huge. All, all my career, I've been trying to do that. The moment I stopped trying to do that and I opened up a little podcast and, and then I had them on my Rolodex and I could call them anytime I want. And they call me now. <laughs> and I don't, you know what I mean? And, and I was like, wow, that's another example of that. Like all of a sudden I literally could call probably a hundred different producers or directors. If I called them, I go, Hey, can you give me an intro to this person? Or if I was interested in going back down that road, I could yeah. easily do that. But yet things are just open. Things open up in a way that you can't control. So there's a, and this is a very interesting space here because a lot of people are going to think, well, do I have to do work? Or do I just let everything happen? There's a balance. Yes. You need to participate in this process. So for me, I needed to do the work of doing the show and just doing what I do. Getting it out into the world is someone else's responsibility in many ways. Mm -hmm. In many ways. Now, with that said, and you know this as well as I do, uh, I started to teach myself about YouTube. I started to, I'm like, wait a minute. If this is happening, I need to educate myself on what is happening and how it's happening. Even though the universe is pushing things and, and, and getting things out there, I need to understand my part in this part in the participation of this joint venture that I have with the universe. So I educated myself more on YouTube. I really started to oh, like, oh, so that's what's happening here. Oh, that's what's happening here. So now I not try as much hack the system. I put my best foot forward and I try to help as best I can with the way I present things, with the way I market show, shows, how I approach shows, things like that. Our first shows were very broad spiritual conversations, very difficult to sell, very difficult, broad spirit. So now when we have conversations, they're very topical. So I have something I can sell to my audience and know what my audience is looking for from you and from me. So these are like a little bit of philosoph philosophical things. But the point I'm saying is you have to participate in this, but you have to let you have to leave open the space for the universe to do what it's going to do, for that meeting to come in, for that phone call to happen, for that chance encounter. You can't hack those kind of things. You can't. Yeah, yeah I love that. We're very broad here today, but I know, I hope we will still reach a lot oh, of people. No, no. Be, there's another point in this on the spiritual path, though, that I'd like to make because you bring it up so clearly so well in your book shooting for the mob this is when you were, were were hired by this gangster to do his movie and and it never worked out but yeah. the, for me that whole book was about ego and oh. how it can get in your way so i'd like to just talk for a few minutes about ego mm -hmm. yeah just for oh. the sake of those who are listening what lessons you have to impart oh. so many so many when I was when I was in my 20s, I had a little bit of success early on. I was making a lot of money as an editor in, in South Florida, um, living at home. And I no one ever taught me how to deal with money. No one ever taught me how to deal with fame. My family was no real guidance. So it was kind of like out there on my own. And my ego got so out of hand, so big, uh, spending money left and right. Um if I if this movie would have actually happened, it would have destroyed me. 
Yeah. I wouldn't have been able to handle that kind of that kind of fame or attention or things like that. And I had a guy sitting there, Jimmy, the gangster, who was literally breaking me down daily. So it was the universe's way, very harsh way of breaking my ego down to the point where at the end I was left with nothing. I was just a, a shell of who I was. It took you me talk about years. going into your shower and just crying. Yeah. Oh, crying, having panic attacks. Um, you know, while I'm meeting like the biggest movie stars of the day. And I mean, we really the biggest. I love how you don't identify him, but you call him like Mr. Batman and Mr. Big and all. Yeah, <laughs> That's kind yeah of Mr. Jurassic. Mr. Jurassic, yeah, yeah Jurassic, or, or or yeah, I I leave clues of who it could be. But yeah, I have a whole chapter on how I met Batman. One of the actors who played Batman went to his billion dollar house or wherever he was at the time. Yeah, and these kind of things. But yet, I was just being beaten down the ego is being beaten down so it's such a weird time in my life because at one moment i'm being said oh you're the greatest look at look you're in the room with some of the biggest power players in hollywood and on the other side you're just being like you're worthless don't forget i could kill you i'm gonna throw you in a ditch these kind of things that were happening all the time from jimmy so it was this weird place that i was in i was just kind of getting beat up so by the time i got out of that scenario i was desolate i was in, in a horrible space i started selling comic books online on ebay to make a living because i could not even i mean i even put i put my um application into hollywood video to be a, a, a video store clerk because i was wow. a video store clerk in high school i was like that's how desperate i got i was you just know, you, you just made me think of something you're talking about how that was in your 20s when you're beat down beat down and i can't tell you how many times i have conversations with friends and we talk about the decade we're in now and say would you want to go back to this decade or that decade i have yet to find anybody that says oh yeah <laughs> oh the 20s if i can go back to, if i can go back to my 20s with this brain oh boy oh. i could have some fun. <laughs> i could have some fun but but generally speaking, no, I think the decades have to be what the decades are. And we learn from our pain. And so the bottom line with that story was very painful time for you. But I love that at the end of the story, you show that where you really saw the gift in it was when you started serving others in your new line of work, service. When I opened the doors to my first podcast and I started helping other filmmakers, avoid the pitfalls of the business and the, the and I started speaking truths that nobody was talking about at the time and arguably still aren't um, because in Hollywood, it's all about the sparkle and they sell the sizzle, but they're not that great with the steak. Um, so that's the way Hollywood works basically. And I'm like, no, you're going to get into a ring with Mike Tyson in 1991. You're going to get punched to prepare yourself. But most people don't even know they're in a fight, let alone in one with Mike Tyson. And that's what happens in that industry. So I was trying to help them. And as I helped them, doors started opening up for me. Even when I did it originally with my first film, I had a DVD that I sold to filmmakers teaching them how to make a film. That exploded. We made six figures with that off of a short film. It's unheard of. I was Roger Ebert gave me a review. Unheard of. These kind of things were crazy at the time. But it was all about service. So that was the lesson. I was like, oh, I'm getting access to these huge filmmakers and producers now. Why? I'm like, oh, because you're being of service. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense now. So then when Next Level Soul came up, it just kind of like, it was just, you know, it's like on steroids. You know, now it's just like so much, uh, you know, the work that I do is helping so many people that it keeps coming back to me. I was like, oh, great. And, and my focus is not even about what comes back to me. It truly is about what I'm putting out into the world and how I'm helping people and how can this conversation help or that conversation help and so on. Well, that's what I, that's why I love the podcast because they do help people. And as I mentioned to you before the show, many people come to my podcast because they have a loved one who's crossed the veil mm -hmm. and they want to know more about the afterlife. And I, by the way, can guarantee you there is an afterlife and yeah. that we may die from our physical bodies, but we're still here. Yep. How's, how has your belief about the afterlife evolved? And double question, have you had mm -hmm. your own, what I call NOEs, no other explanation moments that you're part of a greater reality? So uh, 
Yes and yeah, uh, yes. So what was the first part of that question? First part is your ev the evolution of your understanding of an afterlife. So afterlife, I've never not believed in an afterlife. I was raised Catholic, so I always joke that I'm a recovering Catholic. So I always kind of had that belief in the afterlife. It just made sense to me. And then as I started reading and, and talking and reading about reincarnation and kind of more Eastern philosophies and Eastern traditions and the Vedic texts and Bhagavad Gita and these kind of things, I started to just, it just, that makes sense to me. Even in my twenties, I was like, no, there's an afterlife. That's just, that was never a question for me. I never at one point said, no, just we're done after this. Cause that just doesn't logically make sense to me mm -hmm. that you just are born I'm born a male this life. You're born a female this life. But you said it's earlier, now you know about spirituality. So what do you it's know? Knowing. It's a, it's a, it's a knowing now. And again, when you talk to 360 or 70 people telling you these deep stories one-on-one, -on -one, you start to understand things at a very different level. Um, now to answer your question, do I, have I had anything non-explainable events happen in my life? Yeah, I've had a few um, that, but they were more after, I already had this kind of knowing. So it wasn't at the, it wasn't at a place where yeah. how that happened. Well, I'll tell you this. So when I was after, after Jimmy, I, you know, and that whole escapade of the film of that, the mobster, I was a day or two away from, and this, this is in the book, yeah, uh, a, day I love two, that part. Yep. a day or two away from signing bankruptcy papers because I had just leveraged myself to such a, the stupidities of my twenties, but then also survival when, when I was with Jimmy leveraged myself so heavily that I, I really had no place else to go and I couldn't leverage. get a job. I love that word leverage. You, you, <laughs> I charged up my credit cards hard. irresponsibly <laughs> and know. at first irresponsibly. And then secondly, to survive yeah. to be, because I wasn't making, I wasn't being paid and so on. So mm -hmm. at first it was stupidity. The second was necessity. Uh, and I had no other, I had no other helping hand. I didn't have family members that really could help out in that way. In many ways, I was embarrassed by it. So I was a few days away from signing the bankruptcy paperwork. And I hated it. I didn't want to do it. I did not want to do it. And I owed, I think, probably uh, seventy, eighty thousand dollars or something like that, which Ooh. is a lot of money, Ooh. especially when you're 20 something. Yeah. And I said, I just, for whatever reason, I just got angry at God. And I just yelled out at, at God. And I said, look, God, I want to pay my debts. But I can't do it unless I have a job. So if you, if, if you don't send me a job or an opportunity, because I'll work. I'll work my ass off. I have no problem with that. I will work my way out of this. But you need to give me a helping hand and get me a job so I can do it. If not, I'm going to protect myself and I'm going to sign these papers. And the next day, I got a call from my very first boss when I did an internship at a Miami production company. And he said, hey, man, there's a, they're looking for editors up in, in West Palm Beach. Are you, uh, are you, I already called them. They said that they, they're waiting for you. So I grabbed my demo reel on VHS uh, and uh, drove up to West Palm Beach, and they gave me the job as a freelancer. I'm, then, I'm glad you weren't like that guy in the joke that the, he's in the flood and the helicopter comes. He says, no, I'm waiting for God. And he says, yeah. no, go away, helicopter. You took the job. <laughs> I took the job. And then within a few weeks, I got another job. So I was doing two jobs at the same time, freelancing. And I started to be able to get myself out. I consolidated my debt, all this kind of stuff, and was able to finally get myself out of the hole, got a full-time position, ended up being paid arguably probably the highest paid editor at a network mm -hmm. in Florida at the time, because it was just an unheard, I asked for an unheard, unheard of amount of money and they gave it to me. <laughs> so it worked and I was able to build, I was able to get myself out of debt with that. So that was one of those things where you're like, hmm, how that happened? Yeah. Like that, that's a quinky dink that, but that's a weird, like that's weird. That's a, and at, at the time you think, wow, what a major coincidence. But then as you get older, you look back and go, yeah, that wasn't a coincidence at all. And then, so what, and then yeah, and other stories, go ahead. So what is your understanding of God now? God is all things. God is all things. Every rock, every blade of grass, every creature. Cause if you start looking at things at the quantum level, we are all space. So if we're all space, that's, that's provable. 
that we're all just space between these atoms. My question I always ask some of these spiritual masters is like, well, what is the organizing factor to the, all of this? What makes this table a table? What makes this microphone a microphone? What makes me me? What makes you you? There's an organizing energy that's putting all of these things together. So if that's not God or the source or the universe or whatever label you want to put on it, I don't know what is. You know, the concept of the Big Bang and all of that sounds fantastic. Um, but one thing I have learned from reading history is that no matter what decade or era humanity is at, they always believe they have it all figured out. Their mm -hmm. ego is always, I mean, in Greece, it was Zeus. <laughs> you know, in, in Egypt, it was Ra, or depending on which, which uh, thousand year cycle it was in. They always feel that they have it figured out. So I do believe here at this time, we think we have it all figured out. But as we're starting to see, and I think at a very rapid way, rapid pace, things are changing and things are starting to present themselves like quantum physics that are unexplainable. You know, quantum entanglement, not very materialistic in nature, it, but it's provable in an experiment again and again. So what Einstein called it was spooky physics because it's spooky. So now things are starting to come up that you're like, oh, wait a minute, that's unexplainable now. And you can maybe rationalize it and they could do that. But at a certain point, you just got to go, you know, the observer, the observer experiment, things like that. That's so why I love quantum physics so much because it's actually starting to pull the veil back a little bit at, yeah. at, the, at the universe. I call it really 21st century spirituality now because they gave the, the uh, Nobel Prize in physics to the scientists that figured out that spooky yeah, they, they basically say, distance. yeah, back in yeah, the they, 1970s. So now we here we are in 21st century. I tell people this train's left the station. Get on board, right? Yeah. yeah, it's in the next 20 years, the next 10 to 20 years, the world will look so much different than it does now. Hopefully, in a more positive way. I think it is going to no, go. So in let's a positive talk about way. that. Let's talk yeah. about that because I just picked up a book the other day by somebody who explained how the greater reality exists how what about this reality being like a virtual reality where we take the headset off i agreed with everything in the book's concept except the origin this author said the origin is all evil and and there are these forces matrix style us, matrix style yeah matrix style yeah, to, yeah like evil ai yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and that's not my personal experience nor the experience of many meditators and people who use psychedelics who ex may go through these more negative levels yet ultimately see that the foundation of the universe is benevolent goodness love oh it's all love i mean after talking to over 100 near-death experiencers it's about it's always about love and i Rarely. love the sign behind you there you know you right got there, right. love it's it's uh, i've had a few near-death experiences who have gone through a negative experience but then even they say afterwards I went through the negative experience because my belief system said I needed to go through that experience, but it always comes out the other end. So generally speaking, it's always love on the other side. There's no judgment on the other side. It, this is, it, it just, again, there's a knowing. It, it, it's very difficult for me to explain a knowing, but when, when I, I don't go around preaching this and trying to convert you. If you don't believe it, then it's fine. I'm good with that. You, you believe whatever you want to believe. You want to believe in heaven and hell? Knock yourself out. If that gives you comfort, all that's your, that's your truth. But my truth is that it's not that, that we are in a simulation. And that's been talked about for thousands and thousands of years in every major religion. Which and, doesn't make this any less real while we're in it. Right. You're not going to step in front of a car because somebody says it's a stimulation. Right. right, exactly. And then when you throw game theory in there, which I had a guest the other day on that hasn't been released yet, about who's a game theory expert and also a, you know wrote a book on Yogananda. So I was like, oh, I got to talk to this guy. Yeah. Um, talking about game theory, you, then you start looking at games and you're like, wait a minute, games are basically reincarnation. You have a life, you go through the, the level, oh, you died, you come back again. And, and a lot of times you can change your avatar depending on the kind of game. So you could be a girl one, you could be a guy the next one, an orc the next one, uh, you know, a monster the next one, a good guy or a bad guy. So I started looking at that. I was like, well, that's what we're in. You know, we're in this kind of game 
if you will, which, and then that, by the way, it does upset people sometimes because when negative things happen, it doesn't make it feel any less because it's such a serious game. But I always use the example of Mario. We all know who Super Mario is or Mario. Not all of us. <laughs> Many of us. Okay. You, you've heard of the Mario brothers. You've heard of, you know, Mario, one, Donkey Kong. I, I, I Donkey crawled Kong. out of a cave, Alex. I'm okay, sorry. fine. Well, <laughs> Mario, who let's say Donkey Kong is the game, if we're going to go a little farther back, but Donkey Kong is the game. In that game, he has a very clear mission of trying to save the princess from Donkey Kong, which is a giant a giant ape okay. that throws barrels at them. Okay. It, when Mario's playing, it's life or death. There's barrels, there's fireballs, there's a giant monkey yelling at you. It really feels that really feels real but from my perspective as the player of the game which we could argue is i'm the oversoul or the soul the observer of what's there we happening go. yeah then it's not as serious as it is i know it's hard for people to understand that but it might not be as serious to the observer to the the person playing absolutely because if it wasn't the game doesn't work but that ability work. to shift perspective, to say, like you said earlier, what if, what if this is like a game? It's very real while we're in it. But what if we are these souls watching it? Just before the program, Alex, we weren't quite sure that you knew the right time that we were starting. And Lynette and I were going back and forth with texts. And I said to her, pass the popcorn because we weren't going to get upset about it if you didn't show up that's how, that's our analogy for we're just going to sit up in the mezzanine and watch this unfold right Ex exactly it's you look at it almost as a curiosity as you're like watching a game you're watching a movie yogananda said this the best and i think it's one of the great quotes he says like when you're in a movie theater, you're looking on the screen and people are dying and people are being hurt and there's love and there's lost and there's thrillers and there's people, all of that. And it's very intoxicating. When you're in a movie theater, it's intoxicating. You're there, you feel it, you feel the emotions. He goes, that is just images being thrown onto a screen. What you need to be looking at is go back to where the source of the light is coming from. And that is what you're supposed to be focusing your energy on. Not this other stuff. It's irrelevant. It's the, it's the, same, it's the same as if, um, I always use this example, if uh, Joaquin Phoenix, who played the Joker uh, in, in a recent movie last few years, well, he played it beautifully. And he's a psychotic you know, villain and Joker and all this kind of stuff. Joaquin walks on set, puts on the Joker mask, and he plays the part. When he's done, he takes the Joker mask off. He goes home, and he's Joaquin Phoenix. The insanity is that if he thought he was the Joker, that's it all the time. Method and, acting. Yep. And that's and that is where we are. We are playing this part in this life, in this movie, in this game, whatever you example you want to use. We're playing. I'm playing the part of Alex. You're playing the part of Suzanne, and that is the part we play in this life. And things will come at us and we have lessons to learn and so on and so forth. But maybe it's because I've spoken to so many near-death experiencers and I've sat like this to talk to them and you feel the feelings of them, the energy that they're saying. You know, I can't believe that all of them are making it up. I no. can't believe all of them are faking it, that no. all of them are really good actors, some of them crying, some of them getting choked up. I'm like, they can't all be that. So you start listening to the stories of the life review and you feel what you, you feel not only what you were doing at the time in the life, but you feel what you, how your actions affected others. And that's as close to judgment as you're going to get up there. These are up there, down there, wherever we are. Um, but those kind of things start shifting your perspective. So it starts to make sense to me. And again, with all of what we've said, would you rather go through life terrified about what happens when you die or maybe what Suzanne and I talk about is real. I would rather live in the what if than in that can never happen because that can never happen is terrifying. Yeah. But the what if, what hopeful. if hopeful. it's hopeful and I, I, and it's a more comforting place to be, whether you are, whether you are on one side of the fence or the other. That's my advice. Yeah. Beautiful. I love it. 
Ah, we've learned around a lot of topics today. I hope it, it encourages people to check out Next Level Soul. Let me pull that up down here. I mean, it's pretty clear what Next Level Soul is, but there it is, everybody, the website. If you're listening on podcasts, it's nextlevelsoul.com. Any parting YouTube. words? Oh, yeah. Um, any parting words? <sighs> yeah. Words of wisdom that you always, and you know, ask people the same questions at the end. And I just say, you know, if we're running out of time, what is the one thing you want to leave everybody with? Live in the what if. Live in the what if, live in the maybe, live in the potentiality of what could be. Because if you live in the other space, the opposite of that energy, it, and take it from someone who did, it's a lot harder to move through this game through this movie, through this play, through this story. But if you live in that open space of what if, maybe, potentially hope, it is a lot easier to walk this path. Because this path is not easy to walk. Every one of us is going to get punched in the face. Like, like Mike Tyson always said, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. So just live in that what if. And I think that will help you in your life's journey. I love that. Great advice. Alex, thank you so much. Thanks for the work that you do. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, you for the work you me. do. Oh. Thank you. And you inspire me. You, thank you so much for the work you're doing and the bravery that you had all those years ago to walk out and say, hey, I am who I am and I'm going to help people. So I truly appreciate that you did that. Like, you know, people say that a lot and I don't, I never felt that way. It was just like you, you just know it's something, it's a mission, something we have to do. Yeah, it is. But as as many missions go, it's not always easy to step out that first that first block, that first step. It takes a minute. So I appreciate the, right. the, what you did, my dear. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Check out Next Level Soul. Also, check out my website, SuzanneGiesman.com. I have a monthly connection webinars. You're going to find out that even those of us who are spiritual... Uh, have our moments of meltdowns. I have my next uh, monthly connection coming up October 3rd, and I'm going to tell a big story about when I recently lost it, but huge lessons from spirit followed and how that applies to all of us in our lives. Plus, of course, the next, uh, the, the latest evidence from my connections across the veil that leave no doubt that we are part of something so much greater and love never dies. So I thank you all for joining me. We will see you Next time, right here, Messages of Hope. Take care.